Representation. It's become the unofficial watchword of the hour. Arabs, Kurds, and other East Asian and African people are challenging binary typecasting which condemns a diverse part of the world to invisibility or misrepresentation. Communities from the Middle East and North Africa are being seen and heard on our screens in a way we haven't encountered before. A humanisation is taking place that gives MENA voices a widening space to authentically explore their own nuance and complexities. This can be found on major international streaming platforms as well as in popular video games. However, representation, an often overused and sometimes weaponized term, can itself breed new intricacies and challenges. Namely, who gets control of the narrative? Do these forms of representation truly do justice to the communities they aim to reflect? And, while the conversation has moved forward, how long is the road ahead? My name is Rosie McCabe. Welcome to the new Arab voice. I think the term's been undermined a lot by being overused, by being misused, by being manipulated. Though fundamentally, it's a great concept and it's, a, it's an important concept. This is Saeed Taji Faruqi, a Palestinian British filmmaker and film educator. But fundamentally what's happened is it's just become another factor in reproducing the same power structures, the same kind of creative and artistic priorities in the film industry. So it's very easy to do it superficially or to do it badly, right? I think there's a lot of emphasis on token representation. There's a lot of emphasis on the minimum amount of work done to just qualify as a diverse production. For Saeed, representation has an emotional resonance. It's incredibly powerful to see people like him on screen, he said. But the word is also an easily manipulated industry term. The fundamental question, he argued, is who controls the power. Film in general, you know, the development of film was so closely tied to the development of industrial colonialism. They're impossible to separate. You know, very early films were more or less made to function as... um, justification for the the colonization of the Middle East, North Africa, the rest of Africa, etc. What happened in the mid-20th century, said Saeed, was that overt colonialist propaganda, which dehumanized the MENA region, became covert propaganda in the 1980s and 1990s. MENA people, if they were seen on screen at all, were continually portrayed as the perpetrators of violence. I think it's impossible to ignore the impact that the level of dehumanization that that kind of representation creates. And I have no doubt that that kind of dehumanization makes it easier, for example, to launch a colonial invasion of Iraq in 2003 or invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Today, a diverse representation is a step forward from what was on our screens just 20, 10 or even five years ago, said the British Palestinian filmmaker. However, given the global dominance of the Western film industry, progress has not come without concessions. I mean, what we're seeing now, I think, yeah, there's an increase in representation of MENA stories, both, you know, from foreign filmmakers and MENA filmmakers. But the caveat is this, for me, that the more those kind of films become in demand, right, the more there's a market demand for them, the more we feel the market pressures on those films. So yes, we're seeing a lot more films from the MENA region, but almost all those films are also really constrained by what the film industry wants. Again, it comes back to the issue of power. There are indigenous film companies and organizations among the MENA diaspora with real ambition to tell meaningful stories. But the financing for domestic productions often comes from the outside. So part of the problem is that we're not yet trusted to make films. It's as though we're some kind of in some kind of embryonic stage. Forget that Egypt has one of the oldest film industries in the world, but somehow to European funders, we're still considered in an embryonic stage. So we have to be developed through these interventions, through programs. And those programs are more or less run by people from the European film industries. And so they form MENA filmmakers into their image. So the idea of story structure becomes more conventional. The idea of character, the use of character, the meaning of character becomes more conventional. 
The root cause of these compromises and concessions is the film industry's obsession with commercial viability, argued Said. This places limits on how MENA communities can tell their stories and means political or creative cinema must be smoothed off before it reaches the box office. However, 2022 saw a number of examples of MENA stories venturing for both commercial successes and a new level of on-screen authenticity. It was so brilliant, the idea of a TV show around a Palestinian refugee living in Texas. Like, I just love that. This is Tariq Rove. They are a Palestinian-American freelance writer based in Seattle. They're talking about the Netflix smash hit show, Mo. Mo, hi! Assalamu alaikum. No, no, we don't have to do that. Okay. Uh, great to see you. Yeah, right. Hey, you can keep your shoes on, Mo. No, that's gross. Oh, okay. Well, come on in. Yeah. I think people need to realize how big of a deal it is that Netflix is willing to produce a show about a Palestinian family who's trying to get asylum in the States because there's so many of us. There's so many Palestinian families who got asylum in the States. Mo is an eight-episode TV series loosely based on the life of Palestinian comic Mo Amma. Amma, known as Mo Naja in the show, lives with his mother and brother in Texas after his family were forced to flee Palestine and then Kuwait, where he grew up. The plot follows his struggle to keep odd jobs, maintain a healthy relationship and support his family while embroiled in the years-long negotiation of claiming asylum in the States. I didn't grow up with any Palestinian characters, but in terms of like Palestinian families, I would say his struggle is very similar to what my parents had to deal with. Tariq said their dad came to the US from Jordan after their family was forced out of Palestine and their mother was from Ramallah. And so for me, the connection really is... I would say less so with Mo's character than maybe his mother or his family and the journey that they go on. There's that speech where she talks about all the places that she's gotten kicked out of, you know, like all the places that they've been forced to flee to and having the doors break down. And I I think that's just very cognizant of the Palestinian experience for multiple people. Tariq praised the show for depicting both the multicultural beauty of the US and for giving Palestinian people one of the biggest platforms they've ever had in pop culture. They welcome the references to Mo's heritage through storylines about olive trees and jokes over chocolate hummus. I've never been to Palestine. I don't have citizenship there, I don't have citizenship here. I'm like a refugee free agent. Would you like to try some chocolate hummus? You say chocolate hummus? You just insulted my grandmother. Lo siento, I did not know that hummus was Mexican. You keep thinking that you have Ugh, to do I hate that chocolate hummus so much, but the way that he gets a job at an olive farm in Texas, I think, is very indicative of his, like, his roots and his love for his culture. It's like olives for the Palestinian people are a massive thing. There are olive trees that are thousands of years old in Palestine, and making olive oil is a huge cultural thing. For the Palestinian people and it's just it, it's kind of indicative of our like persistence and our resilience and our ability to like just last so long. While celebrating Mo for giving worldwide visibility to the Palestinian cause in a way that is playful and tactful, Tariq added that for some MENA activists the show fell far short of what they expected. And so a lot of critique is that one of my critiques is also that It's a Palestinian story that's very digestible for white audiences. It's a Palestinian story that's very easy for executives to okay because it doesn't get too political. Like in the show, he's friends with the Zionist. The first episode, for example, includes a conversation between an Arab and a Zionist discussing the UN's 1947, quote, peace plan. Mo chimes in with, enough drama for one day. Later, he makes a reference to the 1967 borders without a full explanation of what they are and what this means. It's playing friends with the enemy a little bit, and it's not necessarily standing up for your own self. And I think that's my biggest critique of the show, is that it could have been so much better, and it could have been more in terms of showcasing the Palestinian struggle, but it didn't want to go there because it didn't want to go to political and probably wouldn't have been made if it went there. Essentially, the question here is, how do you ensure representation is meaningful while also securing your place in rooms that you've been systematically excluded from? Because you have to be in the same room as an executive that's willing to listen to your story, right? I had a conversation with a, with a Palestinian actress a few weeks ago, 
And we were talking about how hard it is to try and, and be vocal because you don't, if inherently by being vocal about Palestine, you're considered too political, right? And people are like, why don't you talk about Palestine more? Why don't like, you do this? And she and I both understood that you kind of have to Trojan horse it in a way. And like, you can't be too loud. You can't be seen as too uneasy to work with because you're not going to be able to get to the point where you can talk about it. Ultimately, said Tariq, Mo and co-creator Remy Youssef, who wrote and starred in the award-winning TV show Remy about an Egyptian-American in New Jersey, deserve credit. Representation is a long road, and they have paved an inroad for seeing Arab characters on screen that are multidimensional rather than just reactive, angry, or mean. What this show does, and what Rami Youssef has done as a whole by also bringing Palestine into his own show for season three, is open the floodgates for Palestinians to tell their own stories and realizing that audiences actually want to listen. And I think what we're going to get because this show exists is more opportunities to get more political, to get angry, talk about Palestine without also being seen as angry. That's what I'm hoping for. The humanization of the Palestinian voice. Here's what British Palestinian filmmaker Saeed said about the show. You know, I would argue maybe we shouldn't be looking to a Netflix comedy show for radical politics. But regardless, what we ultimately want is to be able to do whatever. So ultimately, we should have the space for a silly comedy that might have centrist politics, as well as a radical militant film, as well as the horror films, as well as the rom-coms, whatever. We're not at that point yet, though. This is why every time something comes out, it becomes the focus of discussion because there are very few, say, Palestinian projects that reach that kind of audience. What we're talking about here is a question of priorities, he added. Is it about being seen on the biggest platform possible, or about getting those uncompromising stories heard wherever possible? Farah, for example, is a film about Palestine that was recently added to Netflix. It tells the story of a young Palestinian girl who was hidden in a room by her father as Israeli Zionists raided their village during the 1948 Nakba. The film was directed by Darin Salam, a Jordanian of Palestinian descent. Arguably, it straddles both the commercial and the uncompromising. There's a very common pattern in the film industry, which is that everyone will tell you something can't be done until it's done, and that becomes the new baseline. You know, the problem is with a film like that, once the film is successful, you'll find dozens of people who tell you that it's great and that they love it. But those people aren't going to finance it. Farah first premiered in 2021 at the Toronto Film Festival. It then received critical acclaim across Europe and thus found its way onto Netflix in December 2022. Yeah, I think Farah is an example of a film that wasn't, that wasn't willing to compromise. And I think we need more films like that because that's exactly how you push the conversation, both seeing how it's resonated socially, politically, but also how you push the film industry to recognize that even something controversial, uncompromising in that sense, should be made, whether because it's just good cinema or, you know, as much as I hate making the commercial argument, that it can also make money through ticket sales. Growing up as a Kurdish American, you know, my family is from Iraqi Kurdistan originally. I have virtually never been represented in popular media. And even though I'm not Arab, I still find a lot of like similarities and things in common with Arab characters or audiences. The most I've ever been. This is Swara Salah. He's a Kurdish American writer and podcaster. He co hosts the Middle Geeks podcast, which delves into the topic of MENA representation in the media. He's written a lot about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and is a big fan of the show Moon Knight. Stephen, 
There he is. Hello, man in the mirror. I know you're scared. A bit, yeah. I know you're confused. You weren't supposed to see any of this. What are you? you sure you want to know? It's a series that I really love. I don't think it's perfect. I think a lot of critiques of it are very valid, specifically of the writing. <laughs> but no, I think like in terms of the directorial vision that Egyptian director Mohamed Dia brought to it, I think it was amazing, you know, for superhero fantasy sci-fi media to have an actually distinctive Arab voice from the region to actually accurately represent his country. Moon Knight follows the story of Stephen Grant, a mild-mannered gift shop employee at a museum who becomes haunted by blackouts and memories of another life. Over the course of the show, Stephen and his multiple personalities traverse the world of the ancient Egyptian gods. Suara said the show was a step in the right direction, especially when it comes to how it portrayed Egypt. With Moon Knight, it just felt like a real lived-in place. It's not simply like a dangerous, exotic place. No, like Egypt is a beautiful city. We get to see scenes of parties. We see Leila Al-Foli, played by Mae Kalamawi, and Stephen Grant, played by Oscar Isaac. We see amazing scene of them on the Nile River, like in a little boat cruise. And it's gorgeous. It's just like Nothing like I've ever seen Egypt or anywhere in the Middle East or North Africa like portrayed before. Suara said that routinely, places in the Middle East and Asia are subjected to a yellow filter. It's really like in a way, and I say this as an animal lover, it portrays us as animals to them. It's so demeaning. And it's amazing, you know, when I really found the language for Orientalism. It's funny because I read Orientalism in my freshman, sophomore year of college, but I don't think I really fully got it fully until like I started consuming more media and started looking at it critically that was like oh yeah you know like we're not really supposed and I say this as someone who like I love Aladdin growing up I loved it but because that's the only thing we got but it's so orientalist and the 2019 live action version was even more orientalist (laughs) some amazingly enough Aladdin, for example, was criticised by Arab Americans for perpetrating stereotypes that paint Arabia as a place of barbarianism and its people as either thieves, villains or exotic beauties. Another aspect of Orientalism is interchangeability between these various cultures. It's like one huge blob of the Orient, which is maddening, you know, especially for me as someone who's Kurdish. Kurds are a distinct people. We are not Arab, we're not Persian, we're not any of these, but I think we still get lumped in. Growing up, no one even really knew what a Kurd was. But if I said like Middle East or something like that, they'd presume Arab or something like that, but then have to explain more. Moon Knight, therefore, which has an Egyptian director and MENA cast members, is understandably viewed as a progressive step, however small, in the right direction, especially given the dominance of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We still have a long way to go. I think things are getting better, I think with shows like Mo, Rami, with Moon Knight as well, what you simply have across all these series, you have Arabs actually writing and creating and acting, and it's just about them being people, showing their culture on screen through that real organic lens. And it's great. And it's so relatable. It's about finding the universal in the specific of their cultures. That's what's so important. However, for every step forward, sometimes it can feel as if there are two steps back. Recently, Marvel announced that Sabra, an Israeli superhero and Mossad spy, would feature as a character in the film Captain America New World Order. Sabra said that it is up to everyone to think critically about what they witness on screen and not just rely on people from the region to raise these issues. Orientalism, Islamophobia, Arab phobia, anti-Palestinianism, you know, things like that, that we all know. In our communities, we know, but they don't necessarily think about. Sometimes I feel like I'll be very vocal about these issues and there will be people, including like some one or two close to me, for whom it goes in one year and out the other. And that is extremely frustrating. I want you to think critically about this for yourself without us having to tell you like why you need to be thinking about it. Like we should be past this point. (laughs) 
cinema and streaming are massive industries. In 2021, global cinema box office revenues were recorded at $20.8 billion by PricewaterhouseCoopers. And streaming services, such as Netflix and Disney Plus, are an ever-increasing market, with global revenues for 2021 measuring at a massive $79.1 billion. But both of these industries sit in the shadow of a titan of the entertainment industry, video games. In 2021, global video games and esports revenue totaled $215.6 billion, more than twice that of cinema and streaming combined. And yet the industry is not immune to failures when it comes to the representation of Arabs and Muslims. Arabic representation in general and in inheritance Islamic representation in gaming has changed quite dramatically in the past couple of years. Uh, but historically, the thematic of that culture was mostly used in, um, sadly, in a sense of Orientalism. This is Nazi Ferez. Nazi has been working in the video games industry for over 14 years and currently works as the head of communication and localization at Four Winds Entertainment. Kind of adding a little bit of flair to make it look like it's something exotic, something out of the norm, something uh, out of the Western world, right? Arabs have been represented in video games from the very early days of the form, generally speaking, never in an overly positive manner. But in the early 2000s, representation really went downhill dramatically. This was most clearly seen in the genre known as first-person shooters. These games typically take place in a war or conflict setting. Alongside the numerous other bad guys that are commonly used in, in, in all sorts of entertainment media, you know, uh, whether it's Russians, um, uh, Chinese, uh, etc. Uh, Arabs were commonly known as, well, um, a terrorist group that is needs to be you know uh, fought against or are causing uh, chaos in the world and whatnot one of the most well-known franchises of this genre of the game is the call of duty series which sells millions of copies every year Since the start of their Modern Warfare series, they have used the real-life US invasion of Iraq as material, resulting in representations of Arab and Arab culture that leave more than a bad taste in the mouth. Most of these poor representations take the form of Arabs as the faceless enemy, dressed as terrorists, there to be endlessly gunned down by the player. They've also been guilty of other choices that Arab communities and Muslims have been rightfully angered by. For example, uh, there was a, a huge fiasco um, that happened twice, sadly, in the entire history of the franchise, if not three times as well, uh, was the mistake of, of Activision in, in their games, uh, Call of Duty. There was mistakes that were a little bit more flagrant and more, let's say, painful for the community. For example, uh, in one instance, uh, there was a multiplayer map in one of the previous Call of Duty where um, there was a bunch of books uh, around the floor and one of the books just happened to be uh, the, the Quran holy book. Another instance was that uh, there was a sort of Middle East map in uh, last year's Call of Duty and that whole map was well designed and whatnot and with the obvious, the obvious Islamic iconography and architecture, textures and whatnot. But sadly, one of the mirrors in a bathroom just happened to be using a verse from the Quran as a texture uh, to adorn it. So, you know, th these are the kind of mistakes that really, sadly, with everything that they might do positively, these are the mistakes that will basically scream in the face of others that say that there is ignorance uh, at that level. And there's also a, a lack of perfection into making sure that these games don't offend any any sort of cultures in general. For Nazir, these poor representations and often offensive cultural errors 
are a result of the game developers failing to understand the importance of getting it right, and also failing in fairly basic due diligence. It is not their highest priority, I think. Their highest priority is not that, is not to make sure that these certain elements are, you know, perfect or are, um, let's say, are presented to advisors that come from the regions, for example, or people that come from the region and, and ask for their honest opinion, is this going to offend your culture or not? Many of the game studios producing the blockbuster or triple A games are based in the US. And over time, minority representation in these workplaces has improved, but it hasn't wholly solved the issue. Their grasp on their own culture is usually not as strong as the grasp of the culture of a person living in that, in that part of the world. So there's always a need to have to rely on consultancy and relying on, on having local talent, local people that are working on this project and to give them a heads up that, hey, this is really wrong. You cannot do that. And, and we faced this situation in the past uh, myself. And, and sadly, even with the big warnings and the big uh, red flags, things still ended up in the final game when it launched. So I think in general... It's just a small advice to all publishers around the world is that if you want to incorporate any culture, please do the necessary work to actually not just learn by yourself, right, in your headquarters, and in your, but also learn from people in the region. So much data is out there, right, to actually understand what's going on and not, not just rely on old anthropology and sociological work of researchers from the 90s and, and early 2000s that are also happen to be not from that culture. It's not all bad news, though. Like many entertainment industries, changes are being made. It only started changing into the positive angle when probably I would say like the, the iconic game would be uh, the first Assassin's Creed uh, from Ubisoft. Altair, master, come forward. Tell me of your mission. I trust you have recovered the Templar's treasure. There was some trouble, master. Robert de Sable was not alone. When does our work ever go as expected? It's our ability to adapt that makes us who we are. This time it was not enough. What do you mean? I have failed you. The treasure? Lost to us. And Robert? Escape. It showed a close to real, uh, real representation of what the Fertile Crescent looked like uh, back in the uh, Crusade era, uh, the, the, the Salah al-Din era and whatnot. You, you could actually see uh, uh, Damascus and, and, and many other uh, uh, cities from the region that you could play in there, in, in those cities and see uh, the world as it was back then without having this sort of like negative representation, right? This first installment of the Assassin's Creed series, which has gone on to sell millions of copies, really broke ground for big budget blockbuster games. It was an Arab protagonist exploring an Arab locale that highlighted the wonder and the rich history of the places without relying on the idea of the evil Arab terrorist who needs to be destroyed or gunned down. It's an idea that the studio, Ubisoft, are moving back to with their upcoming release in the series that is slated to be set in the city of Baghdad. Not all games are, nor need to be, set in the Middle East or have an Arab protagonist. But smaller, very welcome changes are happening. These have included timed in-game purchases linked to significant holidays like Ramadan. We also start seeing a little bit of subtle references about, in general, about Islamic uh, values and, and, and culture in, in games, especially in narrative games. The last Horizon uh, title in the franchise actually had created a way to, to mimic the moon cycle during Ramadan inside the game. Uh, and, and certain characters, so non-playable character, had lore entries that kind of define and explain their hook to either Arabic or Islamic culture. So these things are really nice. They're really little uh, tidbits that are being added. But um, in general, I think 
there's still a lot more progress that should happen to have this really honorable representation of, of Arabic and Islamic culture. For players of video games in the Arab world or from a Muslim background, in-game additions like this are certainly welcome. There is another level to this as well, which the industry is still struggling with. And it relates to accessibility and quality of life aspects for Arabic speaking players of video games. My biggest pet peeves in this industry is that Arabic language is, it has become like almost an afterthought for most gaming publishers and developers. I know that there's a lot of things to take in consideration when it comes to game development and thinking about having Arabic in these games is that it's quite a big cost, right, in comparison to any other Latin based languages. The user interface will need to be optimized to reflect this sort of this right to left reading a direction. It will need to fit the, the script and it will need also need to support the script itself because most game engines don't support the Arabic by default. While there's been a lot of change, things like uh, the Unreal Engine and Unity, for example, they do support Arabic by default. So that helps a lot, especially in the developer to create new games and from the get-go in Arabic. But in general, Arabic is always an afterthought. It's more about like return on investment. How much money can we get from the region? And most companies look at Arabic as in like, okay, so if we localize in Arabic, does that mean we get that much money from the what they call the Middle East? No, there's Arabs everywhere around the world. It's it's we're close to two billion Arabic speakers worldwide. It's the fifth most spoken language in the world. I still do not understand how it is not one of the top ten preset languages in game localization. You know that is also part of the culture. You want to honor the culture start looking at Arabic language as what it is. It's one of the most dominant languages in the world. There is progress. It may be slow, it may be incremental, but it is progress. And from where Arab and Muslim representation has come from in the past, any progress is welcome. Final words to filmmaker Saeed Taji Farouki. My priority is really a wholesale transformation of the film industry. So Meaningful representation is important, but it's it's one of, you know, it's maybe even a, quite a small um, element in what I think needs to be a much more dramatic change. This episode of The New Era Voice was written and produced by me, Rosie McCabe, and Hugo Goodridge. Our theme music was by Omar El Phil. The New Era Voice will be back next week. Until then, you can find all our previous episodes on all major podcast platforms. You can also check out our Instagram page and Twitter account, both at the New Era Voice, for additional content. We also have a weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for. Find the link in the show notes. You can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode, and you can also rate and review, which helps us spread the word. Don't forget to follow the New Arab on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for all the latest news from the region. Music